Hi, well, it's um, seven o'clock on the button, so I guess it must be time for us to uh, move to the last part of the conference for today. Um, so I'd like to say thank you very much to all those of you who've come back um, and stayed on to watch our little movie, as Olga called it, which makes it sound really nice. So hello there, my name is uh, Stevie Lewis. I'm on the board of this um, August institution, the International Institute of Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. And I'm not going to say any more about myself now because you're going to hear my story uh, during this 15 minute training video um, that we have created. And it was funded by Open Excellence and it was produced, edited and produced by a company called Mindwick. Now, why did we do this? Well, um, we wanted to have in place a, a clear explanation for doctors and for members of the public, patients, everyone, um, a clear explanation of how antidepressant withdrawal uh, presents itself and how to help people withdraw safely. And the presenting itself is because we know that prescribers are not recognizing it when, when they see it. So we know that patients' actual experience of taking antidepressants is very different from prescribers' expectations. Um, we know this anecdotally through people like Laura Delano, whose story, that very moving story that you heard today, and, um, and me, because Laura and I, we have stuck our hands up and made a bit of a fuss about it. And we know now via academic research, uh, Professor John Reed's research, who is our chairman, um, and in that research, it has proved that if you're prescribed an antidepressant, you are more likely than not to go through some form of withdrawal. What you are going to see in this film is a two-way discussion between Dr. Mark Horowitz, who is here with me now, and me. Um, we have put together a question and answer format where I describe my time on the drug and my difficulties with withdrawal, protracted withdrawal, and Mark explains the science behind my experience. And I should say at this point, if this is a movie, movies these days, they're about superheroes, aren't they? And Mark Horowitz is my superhero. So Mark then moves on very importantly to describe how to taper safely and how to support someone in withdrawal. And the timing for this we believe is perfect because NICE has just published their new guidelines which is called, the, the guidelines are called medicines associated with dependence or withdrawal symptoms, the safe prescribing and withdrawal management for adults. And within these guidelines, conspicuous by its absence is detailed for prescribers on how to taper. So we very much hope you're going to learn something valuable here. And at the end, there are 30 minutes set aside for questions and I would please ask you to put those in the Q&A box. Um, and Mark and I will um, try and answer some of those after the screening. And I suspect that the majority of them are going to be for Mark. And Lucy has asked me to add anybody who is watching this video in Eventbrite, if you have problems hearing the video, um, there is a button which says view the event in Zoom, um, a button under the screen in orange, and you need to click on that in order um, for the, uh, for the volume to come up. There we are. I will say goodbye now and see you all again at the end of the film. I think we're ready to roll, Lucy. Thank you very much.
training video is presented by the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. The Institute supports the human right to informed choice with regard to psychiatric drugs. Our goals include the development of research and practice based knowledge that will facilitate safe reduction and withdrawal from psychiatric drugs. In line with that, the subject of the video you're watching is how to withdraw safely from antidepressants. My name is Stevie Lewis. I'm a campaigner who for the past three years has been bringing to the attention of the public, UK governments and the NHS, the potential for patients to become physically dependent on SSRI antidepressants. And importantly, how to recognize and support people in antidepressant withdrawal. Our aim for today is to explain to doctors and members of the public how withdrawal presents itself and how to help people withdraw safely so they don't have to go through the unpleasant and protracted withdrawal process that I had to. To set the scene for this, I'm going to give you some background on my own experience. And then I'm going to be talking to an expert in antidepressant withdrawal and safe tapering, Dr. Mark Horowitz. We're planning to cover the process of how to identify withdrawal, how to safely taper and how to stop antidepressants, which we hope will be educational for doctors and members of the public alike. Mark Horowitz is a clinical research fellow in psychiatry at UCL and the NHS. He has a PhD in the neurobiology of antidepressants from the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. He has published papers on safe tapering in the Lancet Psychiatry and authored the Royal College of Psychiatry guidance on stopping antidepressants. Hello and welcome, Mark. Hi, Stevie. I'm very happy to be here. Let's start by giving some background on my experience with antidepressants. I took an SSRI, um, Siroxat or Paroxetine, which is its generic name, for 17 years. And I didn't choose to take it for that long. I took it willingly for about three years in all. And the rest I spent trying to stop. I went to the doctor originally with intermittent insomnia, which happened when I went away on business. And it had happened to me once in the past when I first went to university. And I remembered that the very occasional Mogadon, which is a benzodiazepine, had solved the problem nicely. So that's what I went along for. My GP at the time asked me some additional questions. I told him about the unexplained levels of low anxiety I had once a month. And he then shocked me, really, by telling me that I was on the edge of a clinical depression that I had a chemical balance in my brain and that my brain wasn't producing enough serotonin and that I needed to take this antidepressant Siroxat, brand name, as I mentioned, for paroxetine in the United Kingdom. I needed to take a tablet daily to correct this imbalance. Now, I already knew about the potential for addiction with the benzodiazepines. Um, that class of drugs includes Valium or Xanax, Ativan. Um, and I asked him at the time if this could happen with Siroxat, and he assured me this was a new class of drugs and that I couldn't become addicted to it. And looking back, the word withdrawal didn't feature in that or any subsequent dialogues with him. So I took Siroxat for about six months and then um, I decided to stop because I felt fine. And I had about three weeks of dizziness and nausea and it was bad enough that I went to see the doctor with the problem and he suggested I had labyrinthitis. I then had about a nine month break uh, during which I didn't take anything, but I had some um, difficult life events. Uh, my mother died. I had three miscarriages. And so um, I ended up with similar symptoms of anxiety and insomnia. And I went back to the doctor and these symptoms were again attributed to my chemical imbalance. So back on Siroxat for about a year and um, I stopped again because I felt perfectly well. And this time I noticed within about 36 to 48 hours, I was feeling quite anxious. I couldn't sleep. I had no appetite and I couldn't stop crying. Um, the doctor this time said that I had relapsed 
Uh, my original symptoms were worse. I had a general anxiety disorder. And this was a diagnosis I just couldn't argue with because I never experienced symptoms like this ever in my life before. So back on Siroxat for another just under two years, I think. And I stopped again. Um, I wanted to see if my brain chemicals were now balanced. Um, but I found again the symptoms were even worse. And I noticed that there seemed to be a pattern to my symptoms arriving and their resolution. They seemed to be predictable. There seemed to be a time element to this. 36 to 48 hours after stopping the drug, I became more ill than I could ever remember being. And after about the same period of time when I reintroduced, reintroduced the drug, I felt perfectly well again. And this made me wonder, is this really me? Am I, am I really this ill? Or possibly, is it the drug? And this prompted me to look on the internet. Uh, this was a time when there were only really two SSRIs being prescribed. So Siroxat, Paroxetine or Prozac. It didn't take much searching to find that there were a couple of main groups of people out there, one in the US and one in this country, who were all struggling to come off Siroxat or Paxil, as it's called in the US. And they had exactly the same symptoms as me. And they were claiming that they were addicted to or as we now know more accurately physically dependent on this drug and that the symptoms i was experiencing were the same as they were describing and they were calling it pure withdrawal and i learned around the same time that this diagnosis of chemical imbalance that i'd been given had no basis in science whatsoever so this left me with future years of continually trying to withdraw and with virtually no support as withdrawal was not really acknowledged as existing. I had moved to Wales, so I had a new GP and she did her best to help me. Uh, when I asked for help, she supplied me with liquid so that I could uh, reduce more slowly. She helped me with supplying syringes. But it's fair to say that no matter what I did, how many attempts I made each time, um, the withdrawal symptoms got worse and worse and they got worse the lower that I went of, of, on the dose. This was what I experienced. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this film, our intention is that it helps to educate doctors and inform members of the public so that people in a similar position to me won't struggle and suffer like I had to, because I didn't know what to do properly to taper. And the information available to help me was either limited or inaccurate. Mark is now going to take us through how the science that is available to us now can explain and demonstrate my experience. So Mark, tell us, when I was seeing my doctor, what would they have been told at that time about antidepressant withdrawal? So first, Stevie, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear what you've been through. Uh, sadly, it's it's an, an all too common story, um, and, and I think it, it's very representative of what uh, was happening uh, years ago, and probably to some degree is still happening today. Um, and so, the first thing is uh, many GPs at that time and still today have been taught to call the symptoms that occur when you stop an antidepressant discontinuation symptoms, not withdrawal symptoms. And this was an attempt by drug companies to try to distinguish their drugs from drugs you've mentioned, the benzodiazepines that had been associated with withdrawal symptoms. They didn't want their market to be affected in the same way as it had been for benzodiazepines by this negative association with withdrawal symptoms. And so they invented a euphemism, discontinuation symptoms, which sounds much more benign and less threatening than withdrawal symptoms. The description that, that GPs were, were taught was that these discontinuation symptoms were mild and they were brief or self-limiting, often for a week or two. And that was what was in the NICE guidelines, the authoritative guidelines in England and in guidelines around the world, including in America. And really the origin of this description was a consensus panel 
put together by a drug company in which the phrase brief and mild was repeated, distributed in numerous academic papers until it became uh, almost a, a pharmaceutical meme, uh, a line that was repeated again and again in papers and that found its way out into authoritative guidance. So uh, when you went to see your GP, they would have expected mild and brief symptoms coming off an antidepressant, not the kind of disastrous, severe symptoms that you presented with. So what did doctors then know about how to stop an antidepressant? Along with the idea that discontinuation symptoms were mild and brief, in order to avoid them, not a lot of effort was needed. And so the advice given was people can stop antidepressants over two or four weeks. And in the NICE guidance for years, it's said that patients can, can stop their antidepressants over four weeks. The advice to stop over four weeks was a consensus position of a few doctors at the time and not based on any evidence. And unfortunately, this advice has been propagated through medical school, through lectures, through the GP learning system. And that's what is accepted as, as the basic practice at the moment. So can you describe to us then what are the withdrawal symptoms that one gets from an antidepressant? The withdrawal symptoms you can get from coming either coming down on an antidepressant or stopping it are a myriad. They can manifest in both physical and psychological symptoms. And that's because the, the neurotransmitters affected by antidepressants, serotonin and other neurotransmitters, uh, affect many different bodily systems. Um, and therefore they have very wide ranging effects. So for example, there are physical symptoms like dizziness, headache, nausea, vivid dreams. There are quite distinctive sensory symptoms. People describe electric shocks in their head or even in their limbs sometimes. There are effects on the gut, like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. There are a number of effects on muscles. So people can get tremors, troubles with coordination, muscle pain and spasms. One particularly concerning effect of antidepressant withdrawal is akathisia, uh, better known as an adverse effect of antipsychotics but it can occur in people coming off antidepressants. Um, I've seen it and it, is, it, is, it can be horrible. It's described by people as their nervous system being on fire. It can lead people to, be, to, to feel incredibly uncomfortable in their own skin, leading to pacing and in some cases to suicide because the sensation is so unbearable. So this is probably the worst possible consequence of withdrawal. It's also been found in, in quite large studies that there is an increase in suicide attempts in the weeks after stopping an antidepressant. So, so the effect um, of withdrawal can be very profound on a person, um, manifesting, yes, as I've said, both in physical and psychological symptoms. In fact, there are, there are lists that, that, that list 80 or more possible symptoms. So really almost every system in the body can be affected by withdrawal. So why do people get withdrawal symptoms? Right. So um, antidepressants work by modifying the levels of chemicals in our brain. So many of them act on serotonin, some act on noradrenaline, others act on dopamine. Uh, we, we now know that there's no evidence for lowered levels of these neurotransmitters in people with anxiety or depression. So these antidepressants are therefore causing a change in the normal uh, chemistry of the brain and the brain adapts to the presence of these drugs to these changes because of a principle known as homeostasis so when we are when we're at when we're in a cold environment our body warms up to maintain our temperature the same kind of homeostatic principle is applied to a neurotransmitter like serotonin so when it's increased the brain and the body becomes less sensitive to serotonin uh, leading to a down regulation of serotonin receptors. And that means that when the antidepressant is reduced in dose or taken away, uh, that the level of chemicals that the brain has become used to 
is now lowered and the brain experiences this as a deficit of serotonin. And this is what causes withdrawal symptoms. And the withdrawal symptoms probably last as long as it takes the brain to go back to its normal level of sensitivity. So it's, 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 it's um, level of sensitivity before the antidepressant was started. Um, this also helps to explain why withdrawal symptoms can last so long. People often say, well, the drug is out of the body, so how could you possibly have withdrawal symptoms? Yeah. And this is a misunderstanding of what's causing withdrawal. Withdrawal is caused by a difference between what the brain expects in terms of levels of, of, of neurochemicals and what's actually provided. And it's the time taken for the brain to get used to the lower levels that, that explains why withdrawal symptoms can last so long. And if, that's, if, if your system takes months or years to get back to normal, then that's the period of time that someone will experience withdrawal symptoms. And now that we understand that, it makes a lot more sense why people can have such long lasting symptoms. And, and then um, it also helps to explain why there's so many myriad varied symptoms of withdrawal. We have serotonin receptors in the gut, for example, and that's why people will have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. We have serotonin receptors all throughout um, uh, the nervous system, muscles, and so all of these systems can be affected by withdrawal. Yeah, you can you can see, can't you, how what you're describing there is 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 such a chaotic range of symptoms which um, I experienced firsthand, and how this th these must baffle GPs. Um, I, I mean, for example, I went, I visited my GP for problems with palpitations, insomnia, I saw specialists for gut problems, I developed a movement disorder, and what you're describing there is, is um, all these can be traced back to how serotonin affects the body and mind. Um, and you, you can also tell that doctors think that they are being um, uh, presented with mental health sy sy symptoms as opposed to what is really happening, um, physical reactions to the absence of the drug. And this is so important for doctors to understand. This is, this is a physical problem. And I wish my GP had known that. And um, it's good to hear that hopefully things are changing now and this aspect of withdrawal is going to be recognised. So I exactly, I, I think GPs are, are baffled by these presentations because there is such a wide range of symptoms and they're also very um, uh, taught to be very closely vigilant of a relapse. So they're always thinking in their mind, is this person relapsing with anxiety and depression? And that causes them to focus on the psychological manifestations of withdrawal rather than the physical symptoms. I think that leads to a lot of the trouble that we will hopefully talk about. Well, yes. Yeah. So can withdrawal symptoms be mistaken by uh, a prescriber for a return of the underlying condition? So, so I think the answer is absolutely. And I think it happens very common of the, the tens of thousands of people um, on uh, peer led websites who, who are uh, getting advice on how to come off the present safely. Most of them say that they're there because they had withdrawal symptoms that were misdiagnosed as a return of their condition by their GP or psychiatrist. So it, it must be a widespread phenomenon. And it's very easy to understand why that might be, because we know that withdrawal symptoms include anxiety, depressed mood, and poor sleep, which, which can look a lot like a return of the underlying condition. We know that these mood symptoms can be withdrawal symptoms because even people with no underlying mental health condition experience these symptoms when they reduce or stop an antidepressant. So for example, people who are prescribed an antidepressant for pain or the menopause, when they reduce their antidepressant, they can experience these symptoms. So it's not just people that have an underlying condition and that's how we're, we can be sure that these are withdrawal symptoms. It's very easy for GPs to make the mistake of thinking this is the underlying condition coming back because a patient walks in the first thing they say is they're anxious they can't sleep um, and, and gps have been taught one that discontinuation symptoms are generally mild and brief so when someone comes into their office saying you know i've got these very severe symptoms they've been here for weeks the first thing they're going to think about is relapse because that doesn't match their description in their minds of discontinuation symptoms being mild and brief. Uh, it's also especially likely to occur if the GP 
doesn't think or know to ask about other symptoms, uh, especially physical symptoms that make withdrawal symptoms more distinctive. So I think foremost in a, in a, in a GP's mind uh, uh, is relapse. You've got to be a, a pretty um, clued up GP to ask about attendant withdrawal symptoms like dizziness, or nausea, or, or muscle problems, something that will help you distinguish it from uh, an underlying condition coming back. I think that's why it happens so, so commonly that these withdrawal symptoms are mistaken for a return of an underlying condition then this is really, really important for people, um, anybody who is watching us now, Mark, how can withdrawal symptoms be distinguished from relapse? I think there are a few clues that can help um, both patients and doctors distinguish withdrawal symptoms from relapse, um, some of which we, we've touched on. So one is quicker onset for withdrawal symptoms. So people experience withdrawal symptoms often days after reducing or stopping their medication. In some of the shorter acting drugs like paroxetine, it can actually happen within, a, within hours of missing a dose. Um, that, is, that is not typical for a return of an underlying condition, which can take weeks or months after stopping a medication. There's a bit of a proviso to this in that long acting drugs like fluoxetine or Prozac can have withdrawal symptoms that are themselves delayed by days or weeks. And sometimes you hear of patients that do experience withdrawal symptoms, even in shorter acting drugs that are delayed longer. So I think people need to have uh, a high index of suspicion for withdrawal symptoms, but one clue is happening soon after reducing dose. Probably the most helpful um, aspect to look for is symptoms other than psychological symptoms that are present along with them. So if someone comes in with anxiety and trouble sleeping, it's worth asking about other symptoms like dizziness, like nausea, like electric shock sensations that are clearly not symptoms of an underlying anxious or depressive disorder and help to distinguish it as a withdrawal syndrome. I think it's also worth saying that if a person has psychological symptoms that are very different from their underlying condition, that's another clue that's probably withdrawal. So if someone went on a medication because they had low mood and they were sleeping all the time, and now a few days after stopping their medication, they can't sleep and are having panic attacks, completely different symptoms from their underlying condition, it's much more likely that they've developed withdrawal symptoms rather than happening to coincidentally develop a new mental health condition just at the moment they've stopped a medication. Possible, but very unlikely, much more plausible that they've got symptoms related to the change in the drug. Um, so I think it's good for doctors to understand what were the original symptoms and use that to distinguish them from whatever is happening when people come in with new symptoms after stopping their drug. Another way to help distinguish, more helpful in retrospect, I think you've gone through something similar, that when you restart the drug, the symptoms go away reasonably quickly if you restart it soon after the symptoms come on. So if you've been off the drug for a couple of weeks, you go back on it, often people will experience an improvement in their symptoms over a few days. It's a little bit less likely to have as quick an effect if you wait months afterwards, but even then it can improve symptoms. And that is a sign probably that it's withdrawal symptoms if they are if they resolve fairly quickly after restarting a medication. Another thing for people who are making small reductions, they can often see a wave pattern of withdrawal symptoms. Uh, symptoms come on a few days after stopping, they get worse, they reach a peak, they start to improve and they resolve. And that pattern of worsening and, and getting better is very typical of withdrawal and different from return of, a, of an underlying condition, which can stick around for a lot longer. I think the last thing to say is what is not useful. And that is, I think, a, a historical idea that if someone has symptoms that are very severe or that are lasting a long time, then that must be a return of their underlying condition. Now that we understand that withdrawal symptoms can be severe and can be long lasting, that is no longer a very helpful um, uh, characteristic to help distinguish withdrawal from relapse. That leads us on really very neatly to our next question. What has happened recently with our understanding of how hard it is to stop antidepressants? 
Right. So there has been really a, a burgeoning interest in this topic over the last few years, and we, we've learned a lot of things about it. I mean, in, in reality, the first cases of people having trouble stopping antidepressants because of withdrawal symptoms uh, were first reported in the, in the early 1990s. So it's really been known now for 30 years. But the first systematic review of this topic was only done uh, a couple of years ago uh, by, by Davies and Reed. And what this review looked at, it was all the existing studies about uh, withdrawal symptoms. And, and its findings were, were quite startling to the field. And what they, what they showed essentially was withdrawal is more common, more severe and more long lasting than official guidance had set up until that point. They, they found that withdrawal symptoms occur in about half of people, no matter what sort of study you're looking at, and that in, in maybe up to a half of, of patients to experience withdrawal, these symptoms are severe, and they often last longer than a week or two with groups of some patients experiencing symptoms that go for months or even years. Um, these, these findings were reflected in a report put out by Public Health England, the major public health body finding very, very similar um, findings. This also led to widespread recognition by the Royal College of Psychiatrists in England and also NICE, the producer of guidelines for, for doctors in England, who both updated their guidance to recognize, first of all, that withdrawal symptoms is the scientifically correct term for what was previously called discontinuation symptoms, which is a helpful step to, to help understand what is going on. And also that people can experience withdrawal symptoms that are both severe and long lasting. Um, and and, and uh, to its credit, the Royal College of Psychiatrists put out a position statement that advises doctors that they should be informing patient, patients of the possibility of both severe and long lasting withdrawal symptoms when they stop an antidepressant at the time they're considering starting it. So this should be part of informed consent that a patient may, may decide they want to use an antidepressant, but they should be aware of the difficulty that some people have when they're trying to stop it. And so I think there is, is much uh, more widespread recognition of, of the trouble people have when stopping these drugs now. The, the Davies Reed uh, research was a game changer, really. I mean, when I think back, I always had the impression that my doctor thought that I was an anomaly. Um, I remember specifically her saying to me, I've lots of people on Siroxat and they're fine. Um, and she seemed mystified by what was happening to me. And I guess that um, she and uh, most other prescribers just don't see withdrawal because they're not expecting to. And through Davies and Reed, we now know that it is actually more likely than not that you will have some form of withdrawal. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think what was what was one of the most startling findings was how common withdrawal is. And I think you, you've said it pro probably correctly about GPs. It's very hard to see something that you haven't been trained to see. Mm. And so I think a lot of GPs are seeing a lot of relapse or a lot of return of people to underlying condition because they've been trained to see that rather than to see withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. So where are we now with the understanding of how to stop antidepressants? So, so along with the interest in withdrawal, there's also been uh, increasing interest in what is the safest way to stop antidepressants. And I think over the last few years, we've developed a, a slightly more sophisticated understanding of how to stop antidepressants safely. And this has been based on some studies that have been conducted, a better understanding of the pharmacology, the way these drugs work, but mostly a lot of clinical experience especially a lot of patient-led experience from the sort of peer support groups that, that you received advice from that have now proliferated around the internet with people like Adele Framer at Surviving Antidepressants really contributing to greater understanding of how to come off these drugs more safely. I think it's very well summarised in the guidance put forward by the Royal College of Psychiatry on how to come off antidepressants. And they, they make some uh, general comments to start with. So this is guidance that was published um, at the end of 2020. And they recommend, first of all, that patients who have been on antidepressants for more than a few weeks uh, taper off over months or longer, meaning that some people will take years. 
They suggest going down to very small doses for some patients, perhaps less than a milligram before stopping. And they recommend going down in smaller and smaller size reductions as you get to lower doses. And they also advise that people should go down at a rate that the, the patient can tolerate and so that the rate should be titrated to what the person can, can, can handle. And um, a little bit of work that we did uh, helped to explain where this guidance came from. It helped to inform the Royal College of Psychiatry guidelines. So a couple of years ago, we looked at the way that the, the way that antidepressants act on the brain. And this is a graph of a common antidepressant, citalopram, the way it affects the brain, in this case showing its effect on the serotonin transporter, the major target of these drugs on the brain. And what you can see is the relationship between dose of an antidepressant on the bottom axis and the effect on the brain is not a straight line, but it's this curve, what the shape we, we call a hyperbola. And that tells us something about what happens when you reduce your dose. So a lot of doctors intuitively think that going down by even amounts of dose makes sense. So for example, if someone's on 20 milligrams of citalopram, it seems perfectly reasonable to go down to 15, 10, five, and then zero milligrams. But what you can see from this graph is the first reduction from 20 milligrams to 15 milligrams causes this very small decrease in effect on the brain. The reduction from 15 to 10 causes a slightly larger decrease in effect. Going from 10 to five will cause a slightly larger effect on the brain, but going down from five to zero will cause this incredibly large change in effect on the brain. And this very much matches what patients report, that as they get down to lower doses, uh, actually, as Stevie mentioned, this, the withdrawal symptoms get worse. And it's probably because there's larger changes happening to, to, the, to the equilibrium of the brain. These bigger changes are causing bigger disruptions. And so from this, we guess that it makes more sense to reduce antidepressants in such a way that it reduces the effect on the brain by even amounts rather than even amounts of dose. And so to produce even amounts of reduction of effect on the brain, in this case, 20 percentage points, requires this rather peculiar pattern of dose reduction, a hyperbolic pattern of dose reduction, because it matches the curve, where each reduction becomes smaller and smaller. So at first you can reduce by 10 or 15 milligrams, then the next step reducing by two and a half milligrams, then by a milligram and a half. And the final dose before completely stopping is a very small dose, in this case, 0.8 milligrams, so that the reduction in effect on the brain is not much larger than the effect of those previous dose reductions. And, and it's from that that the, the guidance on how to come off antidepressants safely has been derived. And that's why the, the guidance recommends going down by smaller and smaller amounts, down to very low doses before stopping. And in particular, you, you can approximate these sort of reductions by making proportional dose reductions, which means, for example, reducing dose by 10% or 20% of the most recent dose you've been on each month. So for example, if you're making reductions of 10% of a month, the reductions will become smaller and smaller because the total dose you're on gets smaller and smaller. And this guidance is now uh, not just in the Royal College of Psychiatry guidance, but also in the in, in NICE guidance that advises all, all doctors in England. There's also a little bit of evidence that slower tapering is more likely to produce better outcomes. So in a, in a paper that we reviewed uh, done in Japan, it shows that people who come off antidepressants over nine months uh, have a lot less trouble with withdrawal than people who come off uh, very quickly. And in fact, in that study, people came off between over, over lengths of time between one month and four years. Um, and in that way, most of them were able to, to avoid withdrawal symptoms. So 
uh, we're understanding that the slower that you go, the less likely you are to have unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. Um, and we've, there's also been some studies using tapering strips, which are small doses of antidepressants that allow you to make this kind of hyperbolic dose reductions. And in a, a number of studies um, put out about tapering strips, it's shown that people that were not able to come off their antidepressants by coming down more quickly uh, were able to come off them when they used these smaller doses and went down to very small final doses before stopping. And we now know that, that some people may take years to come off their drugs safely. And this is simply because this is the time it takes for these people's brains to readjust themselves to lower levels of the drug. I might give a couple of examples um, because that's, that makes it a little bit easier to make sense of what's happening. Here is an example given in the Royal College of Psychiatry guidance that I would consider a fairly rapid reduction. And this is an example of citalopram um, and it's re suggesting reductions made by 50% every two to four weeks. So someone who's starting on 40 milligrams of citalopram would halve their dose to 20 if there was no significant symptoms or no, no very unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, they would then go to 10 milligrams after two or four weeks and then halve again. And to achieve this kind of small dose, they would need to split a tablet in half. If things were, if withdrawal symptoms were tolerable, they would go for another step down to 2.5 milligrams. By the time you're down to these sort of small doses, tablets will not be small enough to be able to make up these small doses. And so you can either use liquids, which are available in many countries or other options like tapering strips or compounding pharmacies, which make up small doses. Keep on halving the dose until you got down to that very small dose so that this final reduction to zero won't cause a bigger change in effect on the brain as these previous steps. And if, if things went well with no withdrawal symptoms, you, you would then stop the medication. Of course, if things didn't go so well, if you had significant withdrawal symptoms, then you want to slow down this reduction and introduce intermediate steps. So you would make, rather than 50% reductions, you might make 25% dose reductions. And if that caused too many withdrawal symptoms, you would go down even slower, down to 10% every two to four weeks. And if that caused too significant withdrawal symptoms, you go down, you go down even slower. An example of an even slower reduction for a drug that's particularly hard to come off, paroxetine, which Stevie knows all too well, is also given as an example in the Royal College of Psychiatry Guidance. So this, this gives an example of reducing by 10% of the most recent dose every two to four weeks. So in this case, starting on 40 milligrams of paroxetine, the first reduction you'd make is 10% of 40 milligrams, which is four milligrams down to 36 milligrams. Straight away here, there's gonna be difficulty making up this exact dose using widely available tablets, which generally come as 10, 20, or 40 milligrams. And so you're going to need to either make up the entire dose with a liquid preparation, which is generally widely available, or a combination of tablets and liquids. Further dose reductions would then be made by reducing by 10% of that dose. So 10% of 36 milligrams is 3.6 milligrams. So now you're down to 32.4, then 10% of that dose. And you, can, and you can start to see that because these doses are not um, similar to those easily available as tablets, people will need to be either using liquids, uh, compounding chemists or, or, or tapering strips in order to make these small reductions. You can see the dose gets smaller and smaller. And as you get down to lower doses, the size of the reductions become smaller and smaller. And in fact, this is an abbreviated version of it. In this little box here, there are almost 30 further steps. As you go down very slowly, 10% a month, down to this very small final dose before stopping. And again, going down to this small dose of this final step down is, doesn't cause more disruption than the, than the doses beforehand. And so because each of these steps might take a, a month, going through this process can take several years. And I've certainly seen people who have taken three, four, five or longer years to come off paroxetine, which is particularly known for its severe withdrawal effects. In fact, it's worth saying some people can and can't come off even this quickly and will need to come off at half this rate or, or less. And so some people will have severe withdrawal effects from, from minor reductions 
and we'll need to find a, a rate slow enough for them to be able to tolerate it. That's a very worthwhile guidance to look at. What you've been through, Mark, there is, well, it's a brilliant example of the science explaining my experience of trying and so frequently failing to withdraw. Um, <clears throat> everyone believes that the lower you go, uh, the easier it will be. And intuitively, you can see why. Um, but you've shown that the absolute opposite is true. Um, it sounds like five milligrams is a really small dose and that you should be able to stop with no problems. But in actual fact, uh, that really is not the case. And how I got into a cycle of getting down around that, having terrible problems and thinking I've just not done it fast, uh, slowly enough and going back up. And this became a, um, an unpleasant um, cycle over, over many years. Another thing to mention is that although all efforts should be made to make the process as tolerable as possible for the patient in all the ways just described, going slowly, uh, titrating the re reduction rate to the pace that a patient can tolerate, it is still likely the process will not be without some bumps, at least for some patients. And so for this reason, it's also very helpful to have support and understanding throughout the process from people around them. For some people, the support might be from a professional counsellor, ideally one that is well aware of withdrawal, but for everybody it helps to have family and friends informed about the process, uh, especially because some people will be used to seeing symptoms as a reason to go back on medication. And so educating family and friends about the process of slowly stopping about withdrawal symptoms can help to put everybody on the same page, so everyone's heading in the same direction. Uh, this also applies to other nurses, doctors involved in the person's medical care, because there is such a, a poor understanding of withdrawal from antidepressants generally, it can lead to all sorts of misinterpretations from people around them. So it's good to keep all relevant medical staff informed. Um, and, and because it can be a difficult time for people, having support, having understanding from people around them can make a big difference. There's also a range of coping skills that might be useful for someone going through unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, including distraction, mindfulness, light exercise, amongst others, very much depending on what people are used to using to get through difficult times. One thing that can be very helpful is simply to remind people that what they're experiencing is likely to be withdrawal symptoms, that they're transitory, that they will resolve. Uh, people can, can lose perspective sometimes when in the midst of withdrawal symptoms. And there are lots of good resources around for further coping techniques in places like the Withdrawal Project online and, and the guidance for psychological therapists also available online, uh, put together by different psychotherapy organizations led by Anne Guy. And another thing that might be useful is for people to plan um, early on to have uh, their professional and social duties arranged as much as possible around withdrawal uh, to the extent that that is, that is able to be achieved. So are there any other tips or tricks that you can give to people to help them avoid um, the difficulties I had? So I, think, I think you've made probably the, the main point there, which is, Counterintuitively, as you get to lower doses, you need to slow down your tapering because of the effects of very small doses, um, which lots of people have learned the hard way, and, and we now understand what the what the neuroscience is underlying that. I think another common um, uh, error that people make is uh, they work out that going down too quickly um, causes severe withdrawal effects, and so they think that they will slow it, slow the process down by taking drugs every second day or every third day, um, which, which makes, again, intuitive sense. You want, you're thinking you're taking less of the drug. But the problem with most antidepressants is they have a half-life of about one day. A half-life is the time taken for the body to excrete half the drug. Um, and so if a drug has a half-life of 24 hours, that means your body will get rid of it uh, we'll get rid of half of it every 24 hours. If you take such a drug every second day, your blood levels will go down to a quarter of what they normally are. 
After one day, it's down to a half. After two days, it's down to a quarter. After three days, it's down to one eighth. And that that very large decrease in the levels in your body can cause severe withdrawal effects. So I think a lot of GPs um, with well-meaning intentions give the advice to take drugs every second or third day in order to get down to lower doses. I think that advice often backfires and causes severe withdrawal symptoms. And it's better to take a smaller dose each day. And that, that necessitates using something like a liquid version of a drug or making up smaller tablets with a compounding pharmacy or with tapering strips. Um, and I think even though that's more trouble, it's much better for the patient. Um, and I think that's worth saying that for safe tapering of most people, they can't do it with, with currently available tablets because the doses are simply too large. And most people will need access to some form of the drug that allows smaller doses. And that means GPs prescribing things like liquids or, or other smaller tablet forms. Um, I think another point to make is people assume that it's very easy to come off fluoxetine, which has a longer half-life than other drugs. It might be easier, but fluoxetine can be a tricky drug because withdrawal symptoms are delayed after reducing or stopping the drug, and that can make it harder for people to spot. Uh, drugs with a short half-life of paroxetine are very easy to spot because people feel terrible a day or two afterwards. Whereas if you're if it's six or eight weeks down the track, people often don't put it together in their head. So I don't think um, fluoxetine has been thought of as being self-tapering because it goes out of your body over a few weeks. But because we know that some people will take months or years to come off these drugs safely, it's not it's not self-tapering enough to just stop it abruptly. And it should also be tapered in much the same way as other drugs. Uh, and I think the last point to make is the process of switching from one antidepressant to another is not as simple as it's sometimes presented because you are in effect withdrawing from one drug in order to get onto the other drug. And so you have the issues with the, 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 the adverse or side effects of the new drug, but you also have the problem of withdrawing from the first drug. So I think the process of switching is much more um, complicated than people often think it is. In my own research and based on the many people in the same situation as me that I've spoken to, what's going to be so vital about all of this is um, patients actually being believed um, when they go into their doctors and a discussion can be had about the fact that they could really be in withdrawal, that this range of symptoms is withdrawal, that doctors will acknowledge that, that they will believe it, and therefore their, their families and friends will be believe, believe in it too, because it is such a wide range of symptoms. And you touched upon earlier how important it is that there is this new narrative. We're looking for a new narrative in the doctor's surgery, that at the time of first prescribing, that there is a genuine informed consent um, so that a fully informed patient is made aware right at the start of the risks and benefits of taking these drugs, um, which, of course, could lead people to actually um, decide that they might not start on the path of taking an antidepressant, um, that they might try exercise, social prescribing, um, even the good old wait and see approach, because we've learned that um, sadness can pass feelings of sadness, um, these feelings of emotional distress will pass through time. So, you know, looking back, I wonder if I'd known all of this, whether I would have taken um, an antidepressant in the first place. But to wrap up, what would you tell a doctor or a patient now? What are the take home messages so that a person doesn't end up like I did, stuck on an antidepressant for years and struggling with appalling withdrawal the main take-home messages are one we shouldn't mistake withdrawal for relapse so feeling anxious or depressed when reducing or stopping antidepressants is not necessarily a sign of relapse these symptoms are very common in withdrawal and we should bear that in mind tapering antidepressants over much longer periods than we're used to tapering them over for example months or sometimes years for people that are on long-term medications is more likely to be successful than quicker tapering. Number three, when we make reductions, it should be by smaller and smaller amounts. As the total dose gets lower, 
called proportion or hyperbolic tapering because of the way drugs act on the brain. Number four, some patients will need to go down to very small doses before stopping, for example, a fraction of a milligram for some patients with some antidepressants. Number five, in order to make the small reductions of antidepressant needed, patients will need access to either liquid versions of the drug or another way to make up small doses, for example, tapering strips. Number six, very importantly, the rate of tapering should be modified or titrated based on the patient's ability to tolerate the reductions, particularly regarding withdrawal symptoms. And they should be able to go at their own pace. Number seven, with the exception of fluoxetine, the short half-life of most antidepressants means that every other day dosing risks withdrawal symptoms. And it's better to take the same small dose every day. Number eight, there is increasing sources of um, good uh, guidance, for example, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, now from NICE. There's guidance in the Maudsley prescribing guidelines and the IIPDW website is full of useful uh, sources of information. And number nine, although a gradual individualized taper is the best way to minimize distress caused by stopping antidepressants, the people certainly benefit from the support and understanding of their loved ones around them and for well-informed and from well-informed professionals. Thank you very much, Mark. You've been through um, a lot of information there, which I think is going to be really valuable. And that detailed explanation of how the science demonstrates what patients experience is vital to help make sense of what can seem like this wide range of chaotic symptoms, which are in truth a physical response to the absence of the drug, not a growing or enduring mental health problem. And just as you did there, I'm going to re-emphasize that although the science may be constant, human beings are individual and unique, and each person will have a different response to an antidepressant and to its reduction. And it's vital that everyone is enabled and free to go at their own pace. So we hope that this information that we've passed on today has been helpful in providing more of an insight into the difficulties that some people may have when coming off antidepressants and how to be able to recognize those difficulties when you might not have seen them in the past and how to support other people through this process. So this film was made on behalf of the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. We are a not-for-profit not organization. Uh, we rely on your donations to help us keep our organization going, including our website. So if you found this video useful, please consider supporting our work. We are at iipdw.org. And by donating, you'll be helping to add to the growing call for an informed global response to the issues of psychiatric drug withdrawal. Thank you and goodbye. Well, hello again, everybody out there. Thank you very much for watching our film. Um, there are questions. This is the time now for questions and answers. Inevitably, the majority of them, and quite rightly so, are for Mark, who is the expert on this subject. But there are one or two um, which I think that I can possibly address. A um, couple that have come up about whether the particular video that we've just shown you is going to be made available to the public. And um, it will be, um, you will find it eventually on our website at a time as yet hasn't been um, agreed, but it will be, will be soon. Um, but I, I need to give you a heads up that we will be asking for donations. You saw me um, asking for donations at the end of the video there. And we would respectfully ask that for anybody who does watch it, 
please consider donating to us. We are a charity. We are a not-for-profit not organization. I seem to have trouble saying that. Um, so please, go to iipdw.org and um, donate. And that takes me uh, quite neatly onto the next question, which a couple of people have asked, are we going to be doing something similar um, on antipsychotic ta tapering? And I can see absolutely no reason why not, except that we need to be able to fund it, which brings me neatly back to please donate to the IIPDW. The last question I am going to fail to answer, probably, um, but is one that someone has asked why, even though this information and the guidelines have impacted UK policy, I'm assuming nice guidelines are being referred to there, um, has our work not translated into the USA and um, the World Health Organization and uh, the person who um, posted this question has said that they're based in the USA and, um, and because USA domestic policy does greatly affect international policy for better or for worse. And um, that is a very fair point. And I'm going to, going to couch this again in saying that I don't know the answer for sure. However, my, um, my feeling about this and from um, things that I've heard is that one of the things that we here in the UK are very fortunate to have is that uh, is representation um, at government level. So here in the UK, we have an all party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependence. And that group um, made up of parliamentarians, ha um, they were the people who managed to persuade Public Health England to carry out a review of prescribed drug dependence in this country. And that was absolutely fundamental to moving things forward. Unfortunately, COVID got a bit in the way, but we still have cogs and wheels in motion to um, give people more and more information about prescribed drug dependence, and hopefully eventually to enable us to have um, a website and a helpline. Um, as I say, it's, it's work in progress at the moment, but we're getting somewhere. Now, my understanding from talking, hearing people like Laura Delano and talking to um, Angie Peacock, who um, has been instrumental in getting the Medicating Normal film available in the USA and shown um, throughout the world, I believe, is that in the USA, you don't have anything at state level. Um, so in the USA, you are working from the ground up. We indeed are working from the ground up, but we have um, we have a voice at a higher level, which inevitably is hugely beneficial. And I cannot say how important the all party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependence is to our campaign and our cause. Uh, and although we haven't, I believe, influenced the World Health Organization, I'd like to add um, in here that um, the IIPDW has managed to have a small influence on the Council of Europe. Um, they have put out um, draft guidelines to uh, the countries involved in the Council of Europe as to um, what needs to be done with um, providing services for prescribed drug dependence um, in, um, in Europe. And as a consequence, we managed to get some alteration to the wording of the draft guidelines to make it, we hope, um, a uh, mandatory that um, the countries will provide um, specialist support services for people um, requiring help with prescribed drug dependence. And that, um, if it happens, will be absolutely astonishing. And I hope that we will continue as an international institute to have that sort of influence worldwide. And again, you becoming part of that, becoming affiliated to us or associated with us and donating to us will help the work that we can do. I think now that the person who can take on the rest of the questions is going to be Mark. And so I'll hand over to him. Okay, thanks, thanks Stevie. Um, so I'll, I'll, I guess we've got 20, 20 minutes or so, I'll try to go through a few of the questions that have been asked. Um, some of them are, are difficult ones. Um, 
So there's a lot of questions about antipsychotic withdrawal. Um, is there research being done on that is one of the questions and the answer is yes. Um, at the moment, there's a trial being conducted in England. It's coming, actually it's, it's at the end of its, uh, uh, it's been going for uh, now six years called the RADAR trial run by Joanna Moncrief, a psychiatrist here, um, looking at uh, stopping antipsychotics in people with psychotic disorders uh, over a, uh, a year or two, done slowly compared to staying on medication long-term. Um, there are other studies around the world that are happening. There are studies happening in Denmark, in Holland, um, uh, and in Australia. So people are looking at that. What is the best way to stop antipsychotics? What is the effect on people long-term? Uh, Someone's asked, why is there no nice guidance on stopping antipsychotics when there is guidance on these other drug classes? And uh, that is a, a very unfortunate decision by NICE that they would only put out guidance for the drugs that were included in the Public Health England Review. And that means there's now guidance on how to stop antidepressants, benzodiazepines, Z drugs, gabapentinoids and opioids, but they excluded antipsychotics, which is a um, very big oversight. Uh, they say that it would be included in an update of the schizophrenia guidelines, but there's no indication of when that might happen. Uh, it, might be, it might be worth writing to NICE to ask them to include such a thing because it's something that the IIPW has been advocating for and actually, so was the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So there's a lot of people who would like some guidance on how to stop antipsychotics. Um, there's a question about why do some people, why are some people able to stop antidepressants without any side effects? Um, especially given what Robert Whitaker has said. Um, and I guess this is something Robert talked a lot about uh, that in the long term, antidepressants may not be particularly helpful for outcomes. It's a slightly different idea from are they difficult to stop? So whether they're effective or not is a little bit different from are they hard to stop or not? Um, for example, you could say that uh, drinking alcohol may not be very effective for depression, but it still very, can be very hard to stop. So there's a, there's a sort of two different dimensions. Um, in essence, there's no research on why do some people have a difficult time stopping antidepressants and why do other people have no trouble. Um, it, would, it would probably make sense that the more physical dependence or more adapted to the drugs one becomes, the more likely they are to have withdrawal problems. And that might be affected by things like how quickly, how, how quickly people metabolize antidepressants. So if you have liver enzymes that quickly um, remove antidepressants from your body, it means your brain is exposed to much less. You might adapt therefore less to the drugs and become less physically dependent on those drugs and therefore have an easier time stopping and, and vice versa. There are probably all sorts of individual differences that explain that, that, that haven't well been, that haven't been researched. So we, we, we don't know, but it is clear there's a wide variation in how uh, significant people's withdrawal symptoms are. Um, what do we have? Someone is saying all this information should be included in medical school training. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with you. Um, it's, it's certainly not a part of, of training now. Um, I'd like to say that the first lecture that I heard about stopping psychiatric drugs was one that I gave. Um, uh, I've asked about tapering strips. I've given it your link to the tapering strips website, which answers a lot of those questions. Um, I've been asked what is what is done, what is being done in academia, medical practice, and medical training to counter farmers' deceitful marketing terminology of discontinuation as opposed to withdrawal. The former slyly and falsely communicates that withdrawal is rare and unique to the individual drug consumers instead of being a common occurrence with common symptoms. So it's certainly uh, a euphemism that, that, that came from the, uh, the marketing 
division of, of drug companies. I think this points to a very big difference between England and America. Um, in England, it's, it's officially used less and less. Um, that that uh, there's, there was a paper written that in, in the British Journal of Psychiatry that um, uh, we shouldn't use the term discontinuation symptoms any longer. We should use the term withdrawal symptoms because it's a uh, recognizable pharmacological term that has meaning. Uh, and in official documents now, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in England um, and uh, NICE uh, use the term withdrawal symptoms. So there's, there's, I still hear it being used uh, by doctors in conversation, but it seems to be changing. Um, whereas when I read any articles from America, they still use discontinuation symptoms. So I'm, uh, I guess there are different levels of um, independent scientific um, researchers in England and America. There's a lot more commercial influence in America than there is in England. Um, sorry. Uh, oh, I see. Um, well, just walk behind me, that's fine. Right. Um, so then there's a question about, um, can you talk a little bit about, this is probably a key question for people, can you talk a little bit about why people, even if they taper appropriately and slowly, still experience severe and long-lasting withdrawal symptoms? So the first thing to say is, nobody understands why people experience such severe and long-lasting withdrawal symptoms. I think I mentioned in the video that it may be the time taken for the brain to go back to its pre-drug state and that the length of time it takes for that to happen explains why there are withdrawal symptoms. Um, the difference between what the brain expects and what the brain is being given exists for as long as it takes for the brain to readapt to lower levels. There are all sorts of other theories about why people may have withdrawal symptoms. Some people think it may represent um, injury to the brain that takes a period of time to repair. Um, other people think there are all sorts of downstream effects. So I think I highlighted serotonin receptors in the video, but of course, serotonin receptors uh, affect uh, other neurotransmitters in the brain, neuroadrenaline, dopamine. Uh, there are all sorts of downstream effects because everything in the brain is inter interconnected. And so people have talked about effects on the autonomic nervous system or on uh, I mean, myriad other processes in the brain. Uh, and so it's very hard to understand why people have such long lasting withdrawal symptoms. We think, um, really this is from patient experience, that people who taper more slowly are less likely to have severe or long lasting withdrawal symptoms. And that's because if you taper slowly enough, the brain is given time to reset to a lower level of drug before you make the next reduction. The idea being that the equilibrium is being disturbed a little bit each time rather than all at once. And that's less likely to cause uh, catastrophic downstream effects. Um, but that hasn't been proven. I think in, in my experience, um, patients who go quicker are more likely to have severe effects. I think that the, 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 the people who are most likely to have severe long lasting effects are people who stop their drugs abruptly. So that is, in my mind, the worst way to stop psychiatric drugs, including antidepressants. Um, whenever, whenever anybody says they've tapered slowly, I'm always um, curious as to how uh, slow that is. Um, I think some people think slow might be a few months, whereas I, I think for some people, slow needs to be a few years, especially after long-term use and especially after uh, drugs that have a uh, very significant withdrawal potential. Um, so, so that was a very long answer to say, we really don't know. It seems that tapering slowly is less likely to cause uh, severe effects, but no guarantee maybe that you'll, you'll avoid those, those effects. Uh, still what I recommend to people because um, even, 
even following an individual going either quicker or slower, I've seen many times that going more quickly causes more severe effects. And if they slow down, things improve. So that leads me to conclude that going slower is better, but, but it's really hard to be very sure. Um, so, oh, I see. Um, okay, a whole bunch of new questions have popped up that look like they're historical questions. Um, let me see. Um, there's a question about uh, with benzos, it is said that it takes weeks to develop dependence and tapering needs to look different after that, so because of more brain adjustments. Do you have numbers for the time frame for antidepressants and antipsychotics? What would be considered a short time use when tapering still could be faster? Uh, again, there's been very little research on how long it takes the brain to adapt to the use of these drugs. Um, there's a, in, in a, in a survey of people who had trouble stopping antidepressants, um, there was evidence of a gradient. That means that the longer people were on the drugs, the more likely they, are, they were to have withdrawal symptoms and for those symptoms to be severe. And from that survey, which may not be representative of everybody out there, for people who were on the drugs, these are antidepressants for about three months about a fifth of them had severe withdrawal effects, as in a smaller proportion, though not nothing. Whereas people who were on the drugs for more than three years, about half of those people had severe withdrawal effects. And that seems to indicate that the longer you're on the drugs, the, um, the, the, more, the more likely you are to have severe withdrawal effects on stopping, and therefore it makes more sense to make reductions more slowly. I would say, so, so although I, I couldn't say it's something happens at four weeks or at eight weeks, I would say it is likely that the longer you're on the drugs, the more likely you are to have trouble stopping them and therefore you should uh, try to stop them more slowly. My, my answer to anybody when they ask, how fast can I reduce? So the best way to work that out is to make a small reduction to see what the effect is for a few weeks if that was fine to make either the same size reduction as a proportion of the most recent dose or something a bit larger, if that was troublesome, then to make a smaller reduction the next time by, by proportion of the dose. In other words, it's very hard to pick how someone will tolerate withdrawal just by looking at them and the best way, or just by knowing what drug they're on or, or how long they've been on it for, although you could make uh, an estimation. Um, and so the best way is just to is to do a, a test reduction, see what the effect is, and use that to work out what reductions to make next. Uh, um, people are asking which drug they should taper first if they're on several drugs. Again, there's been no research on that. I think the best answer is to stop the drug that you think is causing you the most trouble, um, or if you're unsure, to stop the drug that that is said to have the most harm. So if you're talking about an antipsychotic versus an antidepressant, well, uh, in general, antipsychotics tend to have more um, severe adverse effects than antidepressants do, so you might consider stopping an antipsychotic first, but it, it's really up to uh, an individual. Um, so again, I'm getting all the tough questions here. Uh, can you explain the sort of honeymoon period after tapering where you feel good, but then withdrawal hits weeks later? So it's worth highlighting because actually a few people have mentioned that in the chat that I saw. They had withdrawal symptoms that came on uh, weeks or months after stopping. There are some drugs that that makes very clear sense for. So drugs with long half-lives like fluoxetine, um, take weeks and sometimes a couple of months to um, leave the, the bloodstream and therefore 
it makes sense that withdrawal effects will be delayed. But I've certainly heard of that occurring even in drugs with short half-lives that you would expect to have left the body in a few days and therefore withdrawal effects should occur within a few days. Um, it's possible, there's a few um, possible explanations. One, uh, the, the drug tends to stick around in the brain a little bit longer than it does in the blood. So there's a little bit of buffering where it takes longer to diffuse out of the, the brain into, into the, the, the blood. And that might explain a small um, delay. The other reason is that it may, there may be downstream things happening that take uh, days for changes to register. But really, this, this hasn't been researched. So it's not, it's not obvious what the physiological mechanism is. But I think at this point, I've heard too many people having had that experience um, to, to dismiss it. It, it. it certainly does. It is certainly something that happens. Um, and, I, and I urge uh, clinicians to be aware of this delay uh, in the onset of withdrawal symptoms. Sometimes it's extremely clear that it's withdrawal, even though it's delayed, because people are having electric zaps or dizziness or symptoms that are very distinct from their underlying condition. Um, and you know, it, it certainly merits more research, but it, it but people shouldn't be dismissed out of hand because withdrawal symptoms are delayed after stopping. Um, People are asking about uh, how to get antipsychotics turned into liquid. Um, some antipsychotics are available in liquid form. It depends what country you're in. I know in England, about 90% of antipsychotics are available in liquid form. And I think it's much the same uh, in America. Um, someone's asking, is coming off antipsychotics, does it follow the same principles? Um, and the answer is, um, Yes, it makes sense that, that it, it, it would be the same principles for, this, for similar reasons. People who stop antipsychotics more gradually in studies are less likely to have relapse. And it's quite possible that withdrawal effects from antipsychotics can look like relapse, um, which is an argument for gradual tapering. The graphs that were shown in the video, uh, that sort of hyperbola, where very small doses of a drug have significant effects on the brain is not just true for citalopram or just antidepressants, that actually that pattern of effects is true for antipsychotics and other psychiatric drugs. And so it makes sense to take the same approach of reducing by a uh, percentage of the most recent dose. So 10% a month or 20% a month, depending on what you can tolerate. Uh, so the same principles do apply. Um, Steve, are there any are there any pressing questions that jump out at you that I haven't looked at? I'm scanning through now a few dozen questions. Well, we have just over five minutes before um, before the end, and there is one question I specifically would like to answer, but that isn't going to take five minutes. So, if there is one more, is there one more there that um, you have spotted that you think it would be of value to answer? Um, she says squinting at the small print. <laughs> uh, oh, well, I'll, people are asking for names to follow, so I may as well direct them to some of my brilliant colleagues. Um, so uh, um, there are people like Russell Razak, uh, in, in, in England, who are looking at open dialogue approaches in a randomized controlled trial for people in crisis circumstances with uh, uh, in, in mental health um, in emergency departments. Uh, Joan Moncrief, who's talking tomorrow, is doing work on uh, stopping antipsychotics and different ways of understanding uh, distress and medication. Um, we all know John Reed, who spoke earlier today. Um, Sammy Tamimi is doing a lot of work on different ways of understanding ADHD um, in uh, youth. Um, Magnus Hold will talk tomorrow, who's uh, involved in, in drug free treatment of people with um, psychotic conditions, other conditions. Um, 
sure there are many more. I'll think of small names and I'll put them in the chat. I'll, 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 I'll hand over to Steve. Okay, thanks, Mark. Well, there was um, one final question which I'm going to pick up on, which was, uh, which is from um, my friend and fellow campaigner, Marion Brown, who has asked, is the IIPDW going to share this video with the Royal College of GPs in the UK? Uh, because it is extremely concerning that the NICE guidance for chronic pain now recommends antidepressants as the only pharmaceutical treatment for chronic primary pain. And it is, I mean, it's scandalous that they have done that, but of course, anything to avoid the opioid crisis in America, I guess. But unfortunately, yes, pointing um, prescribers in the direction of antidepressants. Um, well, the answer to that question is yes. Um, I'm very happy to say that the answer to that question is yes. Mark and I um, have written a, um, an article which is going to be published in um, the Royal College, uh, the, the, the British Journal of GP's Life magazine on the 18th of May. And in that article, we describe um, what the situation is with the new NICE guidelines, how um, specific information about specific tapering is absent from those guidelines and how this video will fill that gap. And so they um, will learn about that, the points about the video and a link to the actual video, which um, I'm sure Marion, you will agree is a major result to get them to do that. So I'm very, very pleased to uh, be able to announce that to you. Okay, well, we're coming up to 8.30 and it's the end of day one of this conference. Thank you so very much for coming along to this. I hope that, um, well, we in the Institute hope very much that you have found it valuable, found it stimulating. Um, we're going to start tomorrow at the same time as today in whatever part of your world, the, the world that you are in. And Mark has already mentioned that Joanna Moncrief will be talking tomorrow about the myth of the chemical cure. And that will be an absolutely fascinating talk. And Magnus Halt again, talking about um, drug-free treatment in his country of Norway. And then we will invite you to a discussion, if you'd like to join us, uh, a discussion group um, where we're interested in your views as to what needs to change in the current system? What are your ideas for change? So thank you so very much and good morning, good afternoon or good night, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>